It is my pleasure to uh, introduce to you uh, perhaps the centerpiece of our discussions today. We have uh, certainly two <clears throat> educational leaders that are going to dialogue, and we have a, a very good response panel. But let me uh, first introduce uh, David Bergeron. Many of you know David from his uh, prior career with the United States Department of Education. Uh, David is now a senior fellow for post-secondary education at the uh, Center for American Progress. Uh, as you know, he previously served as the acting assistant secretary for post-secondary education at the U.S. Department of Education and certainly acted as the education secretary's chief advisor on higher education issues and administered more than 60 grant and loan programs that provide uh, for nearly three billion annually to institutions of higher education and community-based organizations. David is joined uh, in our discussion uh, by Bob Shireman. Uh, Robert is a senior fellow at the Century Foundation, uh, working on education policy with a focus on the for-profit college accountability, quality assurance, and consumer protections. Um, Bob served in the Clinton White House as senior policy advisor to the National Economic Council and later for the Obama administration as deputy undersecretary in the Department of Education. I think we all recognize that he's played uh, key roles in a wide variety of higher education finance, access, quality, and governance issues. Uh, certainly has uh, shepherded the evolution of the nation's income-based student loan repayment system from its initial adoption in 1992. He has organized the federal response to emerging signs of uh, for-profit expansion in career training, leading to a widely discussed set of regulatory reforms and current enforcement actions. I'm pleased to have these two gentlemen with us today. I would ask David, I'm gonna turn it over to you and ask you to introduce your response panel as well and then proceed with your conversation. Thank you, gentlemen. So Bob's going to go to the podium and, and um, start by providing some, some framing for our conversation this morning. Um, but before he does that, I wanted to take a minute and, and first of all, thank Paul and the, the, and the President's Forum for inviting us to be here. It's always one of my favorite uh, reasons to be in D.C. and since I'm not here that often now, um, I'm, I'm thrilled that he, he asked me to do this. Um, with us on the panel are, are two of my uh, favorite people to deal with in the trade press, and I mean that sincerely, although um, uh, sometimes they catch me at odd times um, doing odd things. Uh, Doug Lederman is with us from Inside Higher Education. He's really been there since the, the beginning of that publication and is really one of the most important people, in my view, in, in thinking about um, and reporting on what's going on in, in American higher education. Um, Clearly, uh, Inside Higher Education is uh, a, a newer um, thing than The Chronicle, which is, seems like it's been around forever, which is where Eric uh, uh, spends his time. Um, and Eric uh, called me the other day just as I was about to get on a cruise ship, I think. Um, uh, so, so we, as I said, we, we have some entertaining conversations when I'm in entertaining places, um, even as I have left uh, Washington, um, D.C. Uh, Brianna, I don't know as well, and you know, pretty much everybody on the panel except Brianna I, I've worked with over the years. Uh, Brianna comes to, to us, to the panel today from NYU, um, where she works on issues around accreditation and assessment. Um, and, and, but you know, when I read her, her bio, um, she's also worked in, in um, other parts of the world that, that I would never venture to, so she's a much uh, braver individual uh, than I am, and I really um, look forward to Brianna's comments. Vicki Shrey and I worked together uh, in the uh, Bush administration when she was working for Sarah Martinez Tucker in the um, uh, Office of the Undersecretary at the department. Uh, we worked together on some regulatory initiatives. Uh, we have some scars from those experiences that we will not disclose in public, um, but but which um, you know, made me even more confident in, in her uh, leadership and expertise in American higher education. She's now at Bridgepoint, and, um, and we're thrilled that she's with us. Um, Marshall Hill is also with us, um, who is the executive director of, of uh, SARA, and um, 
We are really um, uh, thrilled to, to have him on the panel. I think it's an important part of our conversation. We, we talk a little bit about that. Um, uh, I got to know Marshall well as we worked together on, um, uh, through some negotiated rulemaking efforts. Um, you know, it, when you have those kind of efforts, there are some, some people that you are thrilled that are on the, your ne negotiating committees as a non-federal negotiator. Marshall was one of those people that, that I, you know, gained a tremendous amount of respect for as we work through those issues and 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 I'm thrilled that he is where he is and 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 is here with us today. So Bob, you want to lead us off? Thank you, David, and I'm really excited to be here uh, today. I um, live in California and have the uh, uh, you know I get to parachute into Washington D.C. and to New York, where the main office of the Century Foundation is, and uh, put on a tie and do all of those sorts of things, hang hang out and talk about um, fascinating issues like. Um, learning and how do you measure learning and income-based repayment and I, I thought this morning's conversation was uh, really useful in um, exposing some of the issues that are out there and also uh, how complicated it can be and how hard people work to try to figure out how do you manage through all of these kinds of questions so I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to provide some some framing put some some ideas out there for uh, for discussion today. Um, I wanted to start um, by uh, recognizing the award winner coming uh, later, Bob Mendenhall, um, who wasn't here earlier, I think, when Carol um, uh, did the same thing and, and, and brought up uh, your name and uh, your leadership at WGU. Um, and I bring that up because I have always thought that the WGU approach of um, interest-driven, um, project-based, self-paced approach to education just made a lot of sense. It felt like, yeah, we should be able to do these sorts of things. Um, that, that, that connecting with expert coaches who would help kind of move you along on a process like that felt like, um, it felt like kind of the natural approach to education as opposed to the artifices that we create around um, around courses and and schedules and and all of that and um, I like Carol wondered why there isn't more of that and I asked some of the some other um, leaders in higher education especially some who were in that the kind of innovative online approach and the answer that I got that that was that really made me think differently about education was, um, was most people don't have the self-discipline for that. And I real, that made me realize that what we have in traditional higher education is mostly an effort to deal with the fact that most people don't have the self-discipline to be uh, self-directed um, learners and that in and we we're hearing the word innovation a lot today and I think it's really helpful to think about what has been constructed up to this point of having been innovations to address that particular issue so we so higher education century two or two or more ago created these things called courses over a limited period of time with schedules where people would show up and do things with an instructor and then they attached points to these it's kind of like pokemon go it's like okay the courses have points and for doing certain things you get those points and if you get enough points we'll call you a sophomore and then we'll call you a junior and then you go to the next level and you're a senior and then we create this even bigger prize called a degree. These are all innovations to encourage people along in learning. And we, we created them. We act these days like they're some kind of a, of, a, of a natural thing that would exist, but they are things we created to act as carrots to get people to move along uh, in an innovation. Uh, and you know, and then beyond the bachelor's degree, we create these additional degrees. It's like the next level of I, I don't play Pokemon Go, but you know, um, next level of things. Um, and it is in some ways like 
um, exercise and gyms. It is absolutely true that you can exercise based on your own. You can exercise anywhere. You can exercise. I could have done push-ups in my hotel room this morning. Um, I could have climbed the stairs up and down five or six times. I didn't, and gyms, we have gyms, and people join, join gyms and put themselves on regimens and, um, uh, and want to be with a whole bunch of other people in a gym because somehow it causes them to do to, to actually exercise more than they would have if they hadn't, hadn't signed up for that, you know, if they didn't have a regular uh, aerobics course or whatever. So we create these things. Um, you know, behavioral economics is seen as this new thing, but really those were all behavioral innovations to try to figure out ways to encourage people along on, uh, in some kind of learning. But to continue the sort of gym, thinking about this as a gym, what's in a gym, you can see that people are actually exercising. In fact, if there was somebody just sitting in one of those machines and not doing anything, um, at, you know, over time, that would seem kind of creepy. Um, but when it comes to learning, the, the, you don't see what's happening in people's minds. You can't tell whether someone sitting in a lecture is processing the lecture and is is actually learning in some kind of way and um, so we look for other kinds of ways that we can uh, uh, that we can have some accountability for learning which leads me to the title on the uh, slides that you have in front of you but I'm not going to show because I'm not really going to go through all of them one by one but um, I titled it butts in seats and I I wasn't sure whether to put a question mark or a period. Um, a period probably would have suggested that I am asserting that all that's going on in higher education and traditional higher education is people just sitting in seats and, and listening to lectures. So I thought, well, if I just put a period there, that's probably making a stronger assertion than I can, um, uh, that I can support. But on the other hand, I think the question mark is important because I worry that that is happening in some or maybe a lot of cases where basically we have situations where um, you have people can go to people go to play have a schedule of classes and if you do some minimal amount of something um, you then you then get the points and move on freshman sophomore junior senior and you get a degree and as someone who works in higher education policy, um, I worry that if we're providing tax dollars out there for people to, for institutions to be engaging in, engaging people in education, we want to make sure that that, that, that education is real. I'm going to talk about some of the accountability tools that we use now, but I want to start with my main point, which is I think the best accountability tool is the actual work that students do and what I call in this packet ESPs, Evaluated Student Performances. So the stuff that students do that instructor or other expert says, yes, this shows this person got it. They advanced. They are, they have been learning. So not their assertion that it happened, but the evidence that they looked at. Or the, evid or the interactions that they had with students in a, in a live performance that would tell them this person deserves to move on to that, uh, to that next level. Kind of they were doing the actual exercises in the gym and not just, and not just sitting there. Um, looking at student work is something that is not foreign to many, many institutions of higher education. I remember somebody telling me about a transfer from another university to Penn, um, and it wasn't Donald Trump. Um, and Penn, um, she actually was up, she was, she was angry that Penn asked her for um, evidence of what she did in the classes where she was transferring from. It was interesting. It was, it was something where Penn didn't want to just assume 
that this other institution had, um, and this was a, it was a traditional institution, um, I think accredited by the same regional accreditor, but they didn't want to just assume that a class called that had the same name was at the same level of content and rigor as their classes. So before they provided, they, before, before they gave her the units, they asked not not for the syllabus, but for give us show us the papers that you did for this class, the tests that you took for this class. They wanted to see the actual content. So it's not something that is that that type of review of student work. It's not at all foreign to, uh, to higher education. Um, some of the, the insufficient uh, indicators or faulty indicators have already come up today. Um, and I'll mention um, and grades. Obviously, grades given by a faculty member don't tell you whether students learned. Um, and if you use it as an accountability tool, it'll be even, even be a worse indicator. Um, an impressive syllabus. Uh, using a syllabus to judge a course is like judging a restaurant based on the menu. It, it gives you some hope about what might be provided, but it doesn't really say anything about what actually happened in that, in that course. It might say you're supposed to read a book, but if there is no accountability mechanism in the class for students actually reading the book or understanding what happened in the book or the themes, um, then th it might as, might as well not be listed on the, uh, on the syllabus. There's been a lot of research about student satisfaction surveys um, not only being not terribly useful but being discriminatory. Um, students, feel, students who actually learn more from a, a woman rate them lower than a man. Um, uh, students who actually um, learned uh, more rate a professor less because students are satisfied partly when they feel like they've advanced but you can also make a student feel like they've advanced by telling them they did a great job on something and we don't want folks to just feel like they need to make students feel good sometimes that bad grade that you give somebody on a on a um, on an essay is uh, may not it may them may make them feel a little bit less satisfied, but um, but it's it's part of the the rigor of a curriculum. We've already talked about graduation rates. A diploma mill has a hundred percent graduation rate. So a high graduation rate doesn't mean you're great, and a low graduation rate doesn't necessarily mean you're an awful uh, institution. It depends a lot on the context. You can have a very low cost institution, even, even apart from the issue of um, who, you, who you're counting and a very, very small cohort being counted in the graduation rate. I don't have any problem with a free or almost free institution enrolling a lot of people and letting them check it out and a lot of them checking it out just because they're curious and then a bunch of them deciding not to continue. You know, I was curious about a MOOC. I decided to go in, you know, help me check out. I don't think, I don't know if I was counted as a start or whatever, but there's really no problem or issue with that. On the other hand, having a whole lot of people borrow money, feel like they're, you know, changing their, their life um, and starting and then a lot of them um, dropping out can have, uh, that can be more of a problem. Um, so it really depends a lot on, on the, and, it, and graduation, it doesn't tell you any, as I said, a, a diploma mill has a 100% graduation rate. It doesn't tell you anything about whether students are actually learning. Uh, high loan repayment, high graduate earnings, um, they are useful information to provide people, but the fact that a petroleum engineer makes four times as much as an elementary school teacher doesn't say anything about whether their educations were any worse or any better. It says something about the um, those particular occupations. I think it actually also says something about uh, traditional gender roles and what we pay in the occupations that tend to be women as opposed to ones that tend to be men. It says lots of things, but it doesn't tell you anything about quality of learning. And then there's standardized test scores. A lot of people, you know, they, a lot of people hate the idea of standardized tests. On the other hand, they're like, well, what if we had a really great test? Um, the, I include in the packet here at slide eight, there's uh, a, t a chart that shows um, 
collegiate learning assessment, senior, gra graduating senior scores at uh, less selective institutions versus highly selective institutions. And they are somewhat overlapping, but really totally different worlds in terms of, so if, if the CLA is a measure of critical thinking skills that matter in college, we cannot just set some level and say, well, a 1,200 on the CLA is what all colleges for, would, should aim for. That's at the low level of what these highly selective colleges um, uh, get to and would be probably too high to expect from the less selective colleges because what college is about is advancing students from where they are. So it is much more about um, uh, value added that said, it is extremely difficult to actually measure everything that matters in higher education that is added um, because there are so there is so much of it and so much of it is difficult to measure that a uh, that I think the best general approach is we should be looking at what students are actually doing um, in their in their education. Um, a particular pet peeve of mine that I have written about some and I've included uh, an, an essay and reference to another essay in here is things that we are calling student learning outcomes or I crossed out outcomes and I said topics. So these are what have become uh, ubiquitous sort of everywhere. The bulleted statements that are supposed to represent what a degree or course is about. And for example, a bachelor's degree in psychology from one institution, one bullet is students will be able to demonstrate familiarity with the major concepts, theoretical perspectives, empirical findings, and historical trends in psychology. So accreditors and accreditors have kind of taken this construct as their way of implementing what they promised the Spellings Commission they would do on outcomes. Spellings Commission was hammering away on, you gotta pay attention to outcomes, you gotta pay attention to outcomes. So the accreditors said, okay, we'll call these things outcomes. So now this giant industry has been created of people creating these blurbs, these topic statements, even to the point, and I kid you not, where people talk about which verb is used in the statement and what the meaning of the ber verb is. So in this one, it was demonstrate. So if you said demonstrate, that students had to demonstrate what psychology is about, that that necessarily means something more than if you just said understand or something else. I haven't memorized the, all of the Bloom's taxonomy of verbs, but um, it's insane. It is, it, you know, the, the topic statement, it's like fine. As a list of topics that are covered in a course, that's fine. But to say that the topics themselves have any meaning is going way beyond anything that has any validity whatsoever. And um, if you don't think that, that it has gone too far, look at what some of the colleges are doing. Some of them are taking these statements and then are doing an opinion survey of their students, asking them how well they think they were taught these things. So for example, they'll say, you know, if the objective, if the blurb is students will understand graphs, there is, an, there is a survey of students asking them, you know, understanding graphs, you know, very, you want to have, have, has, have you learned this very well, well, not very well, etc. I mean, an opinion survey of whether students learn something rather than just looking at, what, at the test of whether they learned it. Learned it. It's, it, has, it has gotten out of control, maybe not everywhere, um, but um, a lot of energy is being spent on creating these statements, building castles of these statements, you know, the course, the course statements, the program statements, the institution statements, and pretending that they all add up in some kind of way, and they just, uh, they just don't. Um, I think all of that energy should instead be put into some things that m many institutions 
do, but bolstering what they do in terms of looking at actual student work. And I know, you know, for those who want to defend the, uh, the, the student learning outcomes statements, it is true that in some cases, starting with the statements and asking faculty to sort of recite which are the, what are the things that students, you know, should know and be able to do can be a way of then getting eventually to the faculty presenting the direct evidence of student learning. And if we actually get there, that's fine, but a lot of what's going on are spinning, going around in circles on the first part of that and not getting to the student learning. So I think we need to fast forward to the student learning, to the evidence of student learning, the direct evidence, the ESPs as, uh, as an accountability tool. Um, many colleges, through peer review of, from people from external entities, peer reviewing their programs or their departments, review student work as part of what they do. Some accreditors will essentially audit those processes. So there was an accreditation report that I read where the visiting team said, we picked at random some of the program reviews. We checked to see that the external reviewers were appropriate given this institution. And we were able to see that they reviewed um, actual student work. So there you have a system where it's institution owned, it's peer review, audited by the accreditor to make sure that it has um, some validity and that's not just you know something that is uh, something that is made up I think we need to be focusing on that kind of uh, that kind of an approach not some new federal agency that will catalog all of this but um, but steering more toward uh, toward the, the evaluated student performances as the core of the learning accountability system Finally, I want to talk a little bit about the credit hour because the credit hour has obviously been kind of the boogeyman in all of this. You know, if you, if you can just have people uh, uh, sit in the seats and listen to lectures, then um, there's a serious potential for um, there, there being, you know, not a lot of learning going on at our, uh, at our colleges. And I had thought in 2010 that we had address this by declaring in the uh, regulations at the time that a credit hour is not just sitting in seats, but is an amount of work verified by evidence of student achievement, that at its core, a credit hour is an amount of work. So um, a while ago, a year or two ago, I was looking at, well, how is this actually, why am I still getting all these complaints about the credit hour, you know, forcing us to work in cer certain ways? I was like, talking with Roger about interactions with accreditors around this, and it confirmed what I am finding is that in some regional accreditors' official documentation of how they make sure that the credit hour is complied with, they are, and to give the WASC example, um, the visiting team simply has someone check the box, yes or no. Does the schedule of classes, this is for on-ground classes, does the schedule show that they meet for the prescribed number of hours? Nothing else. Now for the online classes, and this is where, uh, for those of you doing online learning, um, you have the confirmation of the assertion that you are being treated, you are being put to a tougher test. Um, it asks about whether it, um, uh, whether it meets the equivalent amount of work to the prescribed hours. So you have a work test for online and you have a, um, a butts in seats test for the on the ground, which I don't think qual I don't think meets what the is now the federal rule for federal aid purposes um, uh, for the credit hour. I should say, WASC only looks at the syllabus to determine what the amount of work is for the online course, so it's still pretty inadequate. Um, but at least they're asking about the amount of work that is presumed there. HLC had the same problem. Two other regional accreditors, similar problem. 
Um, the process at the Department of Education when you have a complaint about what accreditors are doing is they won't look at it unless you've complained to the accreditors first. So I wrote to the accreditors and said, doesn't look to me like this, this what you're doing meets the credit hour. Uh, they wrote back, if you have really good glasses, you can actually read the, the letter there. Um, uh, and said, we don't think it was a problem, department has reviewed us, we think everything's okay. Um, I followed up then with the education department and said, seems to me that they're just looking at butts and seats, this doesn't seem like the right way to go. Um, and that complaint is sitting at the department. Um, I haven't pushed them on it. Um, I thought I would share it with all of you today because it seemed to me like I'm talking to an audience um, who might be interested in helping to push the department to answer this particular question. So I look forward to our discussion today. Thank you, Bob. Um, as Bob comes back to the deck to join us on, on the panel, um, you know, this issue of, of butts and seeds as a, as a way that we, we measure, you know, when we worked on these regulations, we thought we fixed this problem. We thought we had gotten to a place where it was about a, 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 actually um, provided more flexibility um, but but where we were looking at the work, the actual the, you know uh, quantity of work that that, in, that stu institutions were expecting of of students, and we don't seem to have moved the bar on either front. We have we we have we seem to be still stuck in in you know traditional time frames, and at the same time we have um, uh, people still thinking we're we're the federal regulations limit what they can do. And so we've got the worst of both worlds. Is that fair assessment of, I, I, of where I we are? So, yeah, I mean, and, and I don't know if, if, I think there was an issue of when, when we, there had never been a def federal definition. It was just left un completely undefined. And I think the traditional higher ed institutions decided to react to the regulation as it being a horrible affront that the federal government was doing anything at all. And so they branded it as, they labeled it as locking in the traditional credit hour. When in fact, I don't think it's written that way and wasn't intended to be that way. Um, uh, so, you know, I think there was an element of, of they had a lot of success in making it, um, uh, in creating the impression that that's what had happened and then cowing the department into not really doing anything more on credit hour because it was one of the issue, issues where you had riders on um, appropriations bills and you had coalition of, of you know, for-profit and non-profit colleges all, all screaming and saying, this is some terrible thing. Um, and, you know, the, we, when I was there and then afterwards, I think the department just didn't have the bandwidth to, to engage in the, the discussion. Um, but maybe it's, maybe it's time. Doug, um, I told Doug and Eric I'd give them the first shot at asking um, Bob questions to give our other panel some time to think about the, how they will, their thoughts about uh, Bob's presentation. But, but I'll turn to Doug first and let him ask um, insightful questions, which I always get from him. Well, yeah, and actually, I'm going to I'm going to take uh, I want to basically sort of offer a slight res sort of a response to Bob that I, hopefully he can then respond to. I mean, I think I, there's a, a, g a bunch of stuff Bob said that I agree with, and then some other stuff that I think is is um, it do doesn't capture the whole picture accurately. So I guess what I would say is, I mean, I completely agree with him that. The Spellings Commission jump-started a accountability assessment, uh, stagnated assessment conversation that had been going on for 20 years, but had been muted and limited. And the reason it was was sort of limited is because the institutions that typically lead in higher education are had the least incentive to try to measure learning. Um, right now, if you look at U.S. News or other uh, flawed um, attempts to try and gauge quality in higher education, um, the institutions that appear at the top are the wealthiest institutions, the uh, most selective institutions, and they—they they, they were the winners right now. Everybody thinks of them as the best. Um, if you were to find ways to actually measure how much students learn at, a, at an institution, that wouldn't necessarily be the case. 
Um, now that, I'm not saying that the institutions aren't good, um, but they take in the best students and lots of good stuff happens when you put those students together. But in terms of what institutions actually contribute to the learning, the, so, so when, you, when the leaders in an industry don't have incentives to change, you're not going to see much change, and that's what we saw. And that's where I give Margaret Spellings and Vicki Shray worked with her a lot of credit for pushing the industry into trying to find ways to gauge how much learning was happening. And the reason that's important is that what we're seeing now from this administration and the ways, the main ways we have of measuring quality now or, or, inst or gauging institutional performance are economic, largely. And if we let institutions be defined that way, higher education's toast because that's not what we want higher education purely to do. So it's important to measure, to find ways to measure learning. So I guess that's, so, so I agree, completely agree with Bob on that front. And I agree, and I, and I would say that the higher education's failure to, to uh, measure learning, I, I think it deserved a sort of a kick in the butt to change on that front. And I think there has been the beginnings of movement there. Um, and I would say that the, the, the first part of that process is defining what a higher education is designed to do and what, what learning, what we want students to learn. And that's the process that I think the student learning outcomes are, def are an attempt. And I agree that they're, a f that they're an imperfect attempt, but that's the point, that's the first part of the process. Some number of institutions or whatever getting together and saying this is what we expect students to do to be able to do to, to, to what their capabilities are. Then the question is, how do you measure proficiency on them? And that's much, much, much harder. And that's the part that, we've, that there's been very little progress on. I agree with you that if you stop at the learning outcome statements, that's useless. But I think that's, that was designed to be the first part of the process. And the second part of the process of how you measure learning, and the big tension, again, between what the Spellings Commission pushed to do was that there was an attempt at comparability. And if you try to create comparable, if you try and come up with a way to produce comparable, a comparable way to measure learning, um, you have to do it to, uh, you know, across institutions, across programs. Um, you can't leave it up to any individual assessor, and, you, and that's why we've seen movement try, attempts to try and come up with standardized ways. And that may be a fool's errand, um, and I guess the question I would mainly put to Bob is, I mean, I, the, the question of, I, I agree that, that at the core, if you can find a way to measure student work, and there's a whole bunch of work being done on portfolios and, and then matching rubrics against the portfolios, et cetera, but finding a way to do that in any comparable way is, is very, very difficult, if not impossible. And then, so I'd let, I guess the last question, I, what I would leave an actual question to you is, are you talking about measuring learning to gauge proficiency, or are you talking about a minimum level for whether we should let student aid dollars flow to that institution? So I am not talking about measuring learning at all. I'm not talking about measurement. I'm talking about um, exposing to the light of, of peers and perhaps to some extent the public what students do at a college. They're Performances, and I think a good example of where of where measurement is a problem is if you know set aside the issue of like measuring one college versus a number another in terms of the learning. Think about majors. There's no way to measure a have a comparable measure for what somebody learned in their art degree versus the chemistry degree or 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 anything like that. And you have the similar kinds of problems about between one college and another college. And one of the great things about the reason that the world, as much as people complain about, you know, our institutions of higher education maybe have a lot of competition in the world, the world still looks to the United States as a leader. And I think that is largely because we have such enormous variety and the kinds of, in the ways and the things that people study and scholars go wherever their minds lead them and they pull students along with them and send students off onto fascinating um, areas of exploration. And I think the way to treasure that is to shine, the way to treasure it while also making sure that it's not a whole lot of baloney is to, is to require a level of 
disclosure of it and disclose. So for example, um, uh, UCLA had a portfolio effort where they were going to have every uh, uh, major, um, and, you know, everybody would have a portfolio of their student work. Um, and um, ultimately it kind of fell apart and in particular the economics major said that having every student write a 15 page paper was not feasible and i'm thinking wait a second ucla having a student you know one 15 page paper during their time at ucla is not feasible i'm worried about what happens what ucla economics students are doing if the Department of Economics at UCLA knew that some dozen of students would have, that, that their portfolio of work would be offered up to economics faculty at some other peer institutions for them to opine on, is this excellent, adequate, or inadequate um, and possibly without student you know eliminating students names and making it available to other analysts and saying here's evidence of what students actually do at this institution that is the kind of thing that would drive faculty and departments to actually care about what students you know what students are doing on a on a day-to-day -day basis i think trying to then measure that and compare it i think like the efforts that AAC and U and, and SHIO are doing, I think are really useful. And I think institutions voluntarily getting together and using rubrics to rate each other's student work and kind of try to compare, that's all fine. But if we try to create a grand scheme of comparison, um, I, I think we'll, it'll just end up being a morass that will undermine um, uh, innovation and creativity in higher education. Eric. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I, I think that's a great point for me to get. I want to come back to the, uh, the accreditation process, actually. And what I find most interesting about your proposal is, you know, most of the discussion about uh, reforming accreditation has to do with sort of, you know, the process, the how, what I might call sort of the veneer, right? Um, and we talk about things like breaking down the regions or having a streamlined uh, you know, risk-based accreditation process or, or whatever it is. There's a number of things out there that uh, we've, we've written about extensively and, and Doug uh, too. Uh, what I find interesting about, about uh, Bob's proposal is that you're not starting with the how of, of accreditation, but you're starting with uh, a what, right? You're starting with here's something that accreditors should consider or work into their process as opposed to the SLOs. And so I, I want to hear from you, you know, how, if we started with this as the basis, right, how would that inform, how would you build the process around that, rather than the backwards way, which, which is what we're, we're doing mostly, we're just talking about, let's change the veneer, let's change the how, and sort of work out the what later on, right? Your, your way seems to me, in, in some ways, uh, a more um, uh, whole, whole whole approach to it. And so I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, uh, if, we if we took that as a starting point, then what does the rest of the accreditation process look like? And, by the way, what do we do with all those other things that we now require accreditors to do? Who takes care of that stuff? Um, well, accreditors have all, you know, there are certain things they're required to do, but they also have a lot of flexibility about what they do, and which is obvious in the sense that when I read through way too many visiting team reports and some self-studies and everything, there's a lot of differences in the way they're done. And that's where I discovered that some of them were actually doing kind of an audit of the program review process. Some of them, on the other hand, were doing like looking at student work themselves, which sounds good, except when you realize like once every 10 years, like taking, looking at a few student portfolios that are given to you by the university probably is not an effective um, approach, but um, uh, you know, I, I, if, I, if I had, you know, and we have limited most of these visiting team reports, especially at private, both nonprofit and for-profit institutions, are not available. They, they, they don't make them public, except now and beginning to in California. Um, uh, but if I was going through and rating them all, I mean, this is the way something like this could start. Would be which which accreditors are 
auditing campuses to make sure that they have external peer reviews reviewing randomly selected student work, basically taking an auditing student work approach to, um, uh, you know, I think some, some, as I said, do it, but it's, it only just, it happens sometimes. Um, I'm not, sh I haven't gone through sort of the list of other things accreditors do and haven't thought about like which things could be, you know, chucked, but I'm sure some of them well, could. Well, for instance, you know, I, I mean, it's, the, the whole compliance role, we talk about, uh, you know, the, the Title IV eligibility piece, right. right? And there's a whole checklist that accreditors have to take care of because of that. Um, you know, does this, uh, you know, I'm trying to think more broadly about accreditation in general here, but, you know, does, do we first need to, before we, before we talk about accreditation reform, do we really need to have a big discussion about what it is we really want accreditors to know and what they share with the public and how useful that is. I mean, we're, we're talking about a, a sort of a paradigm shift in the role of accreditation here, right, which is accreditors have now become sort of consumer protection agencies, at least in the minds of, of many on the Hill, right, and, and many of the, of the groups that are calling for reforms in accreditors. That's a, that's a uh, you know, for better or for worse, and maybe to their own fault, maybe that's, you know, that's not something accreditors have typically thought of themselves as, right? They have been, they have been sort of institution-centric, uh, and now they're thinking about, like, like all of us, right, this, this shift in education, which is now we're thinking about being student-centric, right? And so that's why I wanted, I wanted to ask you about, you know, what does this really mean for, for accreditation in general in terms of if we were going to build a process around a student-centered approach, right, yeah. uh, and look at outputs as opposed to, you know, inputs, but do you still need to look at some inputs? You know, and, and sort of, so that's where I think yeah, I'm I going think, I mean, I, I think that it, assuming that my projection about how this would work comes, you know, it yielded fruit. I mean, I, I, I think of it as something that could, that would get at the, um, you know, outcome-based kind of approach that would mean that it wouldn't need to be as, not, as much worry about, um, about the input side of things. I also think it's important to think of it as first a shift in what we're expecting of institutions with accreditors checking up on that. I don't think, let's not think about it as creditor, accreditors making sure that, you know, being all about student work, but the institutions have to open themselves up to external independent peer review that looks at actual student work. The accreditors check to make sure that well, that's by, really by happening. Who, by whom? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so we have three panelists we have to get to, and, and, and I think these are all great questions. Um, and I have an answer for you, Eric, when we get, to, hopefully we'll have time at the end. So hold on to that thought. Brianna, can sure. you share your thoughts, please? Thank you. Um, I think the processes that you outlined in relation to student evaluations and learning outcome measures, um, if you take them and you segment them and look at them in silos, they do look like failures at measure lear measuring learning. But assessment was designed to be layered and to put those things together, to look at measuring learning, not to function in silos. So I think historically compliance and accreditation, if you call it a carrot or a stick, uh, to go back to your original presentation, it used to be a carrot for institutions. It used to be the case that you hosted peer review panels and they came in and they would say, oh, I see you do this. We have a problem with that too. This is how we fix it. And it was a, a shared learning space that was positive. And now it feels more like a stick because it's so burdensome and deep and heavy and the red tape. And I know that analogies are meant to be high level and illustrative of the high level summary of issues, but if you'll indulge me and let me respond to the analogies. You mentioned the gym membership, and we all know that you can get a gym membership for $10 a month, or you can get a gym membership for $200 a month, right? And at the end of the day, there's machines, there's calories being burned, there's classes, there's instructors, but you have to also think about the model of faculty in higher education, and faculty being challenged with teaching a class and leaving, and knowing that you burn calories, or doing all these extra reports, um, and when 
they can't do that, who is going to do that? And how much will that cost? So when you partner affordability with the challenge of assessment, where does it start, where does it end, and who is responsible for it, becomes a, a really important question. And when you talk about ESP and looking at stuff that students do, um, we've always looked at stuff that students do. And you know, when you say it's like looking at a restaurant and only only measuring the quality of the restaurant based on the menu. I don't know that that's a fair analogy because there are esteemed restaurant critics, right? Just like our faculty who are qualified to be there, who are qualified by regulations set by the accreditor of what kind of credentials do you bring to the classroom to be empowered to teach these students and future leaders of our country. Um, just like food critics. And they come in and they measure them. So the process um, outlined by the Penn situation of transfer of credits, um, it's scary to me that we're looking at duplicative work on every single level to put every single piece of this under a microscope um, because at the end that leads to increase in inflated costs and when you're a tuition driven industry the people who bear that cost are the students. So the duplicative work is alarming and I think you said it best when you said that graduation rates and the scorecard depend on context, right? And I think that the public does deserve transparency but transparency is dangerous when it's not done well and when the public is not an informed consumer in that genre that you're speaking to. For instance, the average income that we see on the college scorecards. Um, Bob and I talked about this the other day. It's nice to see, but when you have large institutions and they have careers that they're preparing students for that are historically lower incomes upon graduation, like teacher education, the arts, you know, I mean, NYU has Tisch School of the Arts. We produce Martin Scorsese and Lady Gaga and these people that everybody enjoys and looks up to. And when you quantify that by giving one general measure of the average income that somebody gets when they graduate and you mix in the, one of the top business schools in the U.S. with one of the top performing art schools, you're essentially killing innovation by making us as an institution pause and say, do we offer teacher ed? We know there's a shortage of teachers, but can we afford to have people think that they're only going to make $58,000 a year after graduating with X number of dollars in student debt? And I think the standards of learning, talking about the difference in terms like understand versus demonstrate. I've been in rooms where these conversations have happened before. And it's true, they do. But to discount it and act like it doesn't matter, I think, is um, disappointing. Because at the end of the day, there is a difference between understanding and demonstrating. Understanding is, did you sit in that classroom? Can you tell me you understand? Can you repeat it to me? Demonstrating is a hands-on experiential learning capstone experience where you engage with a client, with your faculty member as a supervisor, and demonstrate that you can go out there and do the work. So I don't think we can discount student learning outcomes at that level until we We've looked at an assessment rubric um, and some of the things that you showed today were empty rubrics and things that said yes or no. But even on accreditation, I, I just wonder how many people ha who criticize accreditation have been on an accreditation site visit. Because, you know, it's very hard to evaluate an institution in one to three days on an accreditation site visit. Especially, I mean, NYU has 50,000 students, 20,000 staff members, 1,100 different programs. So you come in and you spot check and you have these rubrics that are on the slides that say, do they do this, yes or no? But what you don't see in a public record request are the 22 pages of notes that each member of that site visit team has that then contribute to the response to the self-study and site visit. So to look at these things in a silo, I think, is doing a disservice to the institutions, to the policymakers, to the students. Um, and I think at the end of the day, we just have a big gap between theory and application, right? We have people who are almost in an ivory tower themselves, a lot of us in this very room as policymakers, who don't understand the way that policy is going to be applied or strategically implemented. And I think um, the keynote speaker said it best when she said we need to have students in the room, but one thing that's missing is middle management. We pull in 
presidents, we pull in executive directors, and we talk to these people about what are their problems, and it's been a long time since they, they themselves were digging in the trenches. It takes a lot of steps in a career to become a president of a university, so it's been years since they were, um, you know, someone like myself, and David said it best, I'm one of the only ones on this panel that he's never worked with, and that's because I'm middle management. I'm the person that creates the answers to strategically plan to respond to these policy initiatives, and I can prep the president of NYU for five minutes before where he goes to speak on something or contribute to a panel where 12 to 25 people are in a room for negotiated rulemaking who all have very high level titles. But the, the reality is, is he won't know the, the hours that it takes for middle management to respond to the policy initiatives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my uh, experience in these issues uh, actually predates the Bush administration, so I have way more scars than any of you care to see. Uh, and I reflected uh, not only on my experiences in working with states around the country and developing performance accountability systems for the Carl D. Perkins Act, uh, looking at other ways to measure and assess learning, um, but in particular, I dusted off our papers from the Spellings Commission, both the individual issue papers that I and others wrote around accreditation reform, as well as the commission report itself. There's a couple of things that I absolutely, and I always enjoy being on a panel with Bob. Um, he always challenges my thinking, and hopefully I'm gonna challenge him back a little bit, given the title of this panel. But there's a couple of things that uh, I, I agree with in Bob's remarks. Um, first and foremost, whatever we do should not be a federal top-down approach. So we absolutely agree on that. The second thing we absolutely agree on is not only do I join you in complaining to the department about credit hour, but I ask all of you to join me in complaining to the department about the thousands and thousands of pages of regulations that this administration has implemented. Um, when you look at those regulations, and Bob and others have said this, Having been on all sides, I've been an educator, I've been a state administrator, I've been a federal policy maker, and now I'm back on the other side, and I'm telling you, karma is a you-know-what. Uh, but I will say, I think, um, you know, Bob reinforced why starting at the top and trying to promote what you hope is good pol public policy always has unintended consequences. Folks are very well-meaning, well-intentioned, wanting to protect the taxpayer investment and the students, but at the end of the day, when it's operationalized, it is always more complex. You tend to lose sight of uh, what the original purpose was. I, I also appreciate Bob's comment about the Spellings Commission hammering on accreditors uh, around student learning outcomes. I think that means I'm the hammer. Uh, since I was the representative from the federal government in negotiate rulemaking, and we pushed on student learning outcomes, but I will tell you, I remember vividly how the conversation started. On the first day of negotiated rulemaking, I looked around the panel, Marshall was there and others, and I asked the question, how do you know quality when you see it? And uh, folks, and in particular, uh, Ralph Wolf was, um, he didn't know how to respond to that question. And, and we thought from the federal government side, it was a very straightforward, easy question. And as it turned out, it was not. Um, I, I want to hit on some key points uh, to address because I approach this, Bob, as more of a, a look at the oversight and accountability and innovation and how those pieces come together. I, I will tell you, go, again, predating the Spellings Commission, there was a significant amount of work underway, 25 plus years, and we were not the ones to think of these things. I think it was a galvanizing moment. We had this terrific commission. We engaged folks all over the country, all stakeholders. And I think, um, as Doug said, it really shined a light on some critical issues and prompted a lot of activity. Since that time, there has been significant effort at the federal and state level um, and with the accreditors and the institutions to try to define the measures how to collect the information um, to tell the story about performance, both at the institutional level, uh, but at the student level. Um, we have no lack of efforts underway 
to address this important issue. In fact, I think we have gotten to a point um, that we need to take a step back. And I appreciate Bob's suggestion that we add yet another nuance. In fact, he introduced the term excellence. I would like this country to take a big, deep breath and see if we can finally come together to find quality. We still haven't done that yet. And so we need to bring all of these efforts, not only the federal efforts, the state efforts, the federal level, um, the accrediting agencies. What has happened in our zeal to address accountability, transparency, quality performance management, we actually have muddied the waters. So if we were intending to provide students, families, particularly those that are underrepresented, underserved, with information that will inform their decision to help guide them to an appropriate institution to accomplish whatever their stated goals. We've actually done the opposite. We've gotten to the point where we're almost misleading consumers and students rather than informing them with conflicting information, conflicting definitions, conflicting ways. We had a visit um, some time ago from, it might have been the U.S. Department of Education, some of my colleagues, but they said, you know, your catalog's a little confusing. You have 90 pages of disclosures. I said, you think? Because they're all required. So if we're trying to help students and family, um, we're not doing a very good job. Um, the accreditors have done, you know, an amazing job in trying to adjust this issue. But again, we're operating off incomplete, inconsistent, and sometimes flawed data to make some very important decisions. So, for example, folks have touched on the problems with iPads. Our institutions have roughly 40,000 students. Only 4% of the population are even included in the iPads data. 4%. And you've heard other examples of that. That being said, the regional accreditors came together under CRAC, and I think anything they can do to come together and agree to some common approaches is critically important. But they implemented a new policy that if an institution using the iPads data is below 25%, it, it triggers some new activity. But again, you're utilizing, particularly for non-traditional institutions serving non-traditional students, data that is not accurate and not complete. And that's just one of many, many examples where the federal government, states, and other regulatory bodies are using data that does not reflect the full picture. Um, I, I wanted to touch for a moment. Again, um, I'm going to offer a quick path forward, my suggestion on what we might do. But I think it's important for everybody in this room and, and many of our colleagues that represent us uh, from various law firms around the country country are painfully of where we are really at a point in time where again very high stakes decisions and actions are being taken on incomplete inaccurate information and if we don't do something as a country to come together and actually for the first time come up with some I don't care what the measures are quite frankly but we have to provide some consistent clear information for students and families that can be used by taxpayers and I think we have to do it now and you know there's a lot of scrutiny on the accreditors it's gotten to the point where this regulatory environment is not supporting innovation it's actually had a, a chilling effect I look at the intense scrutiny that are being placed on the accreditors and starting to see a little bit of angst and rightfully so in accrediting new providers, accrediting different models. There's a, lo a lot of fear, I think, in the community not to stick your neck out, not to go too far. With the release of borrower defense to repayment here very soon, all of us are at huge risk and vulnerable. The, the, the language, we haven't seen the final, but any omission or misrepresentation of anything could potentially result in borrower defense claims against your institution. So when you compare that to the current state of our data and information in this country and the conflicting information that one institution required by state and federal law is required to report, I think it should give us all a uh, pause for concern. Just briefly, um, I do think there's a path forward, and I asked to be moved in front of my colleague, Marshall, because it's a, a nice segue. Again, Bob and I are in total agreement. This cannot be a federal strategy. 
It needs to be a coordinated national strategy, strategy that includes all the stakeholders. There's been so much work done in this country. We have a great deal to build from. There needs to be a process that brings the stakeholders together, keeps them arm's reach from the government. As a recovering Fed, I love the government, but in some cases it's critically important to keep them at arm's length. All the stakeholders need to have an equal voice. It needs to be open and collaborative, and it must be flexible to support innovation improvement efforts. I mean, the two big, so those would be the principles. The two things that I encourage the government, the next administration, key stakeholders like Marshall and others, we need to create this process to ensure quality assessment. We need to frame it. We can look at different models. You're going to hear about some alternative models for accreditation, but we need to come together and bring all of these pieces together. But probably most importantly, in a first step, I would recommend that we align not only the accreditor, but the federal and state requirements for measuring and reporting not only institutional performance and success, but student success. Um, I am very, oh, I had one other thing, Bob, one other comment. So Bob said something, again, um, I've known Bob a long time. So when I read the title of his uh, remarks, Butts in the Seats, I was like, oh, he's going to come in and talk about traditional education for a, a time, a change. Um, but the other thing that Bob mentioned is, um, and what prompted his thinking, that you can't see what's going on in the classroom. I will tell you, uh, and I'll speak for our sector, those of us that operate online, we can see into the classroom. We can see everything that's going. Now that sounds a little big brotherish. I don't want it to come across that way, but within our environment, we actually can see exactly what those our students are doing. We can monitor and evaluate faculty-student interaction on a regular basis. We can evaluate the quality and the content of our materials that our students are utilizing and be able to monitor how much time on task, how long are they in. We can actually see how much time they're spending reading a textbook, doing an assignment, and then compare that to their poor performance on the assessments and the learning outcomes. Um, we're able to evaluate the effectiveness of faculty, uh, again, looking at student performance, and we do it very rapidly. We, too, offer a new term every five weeks, and we can make adjustments quickly, both in terms of the content, uh, the curriculum, and the faculty. So it, it's interesting. I, I would just say, given this, as we move forward as a country, I would hope that we will be more open to new models, new practices, uh, and learn from each other regardless of what sector that we participate Thank you, in. Thank you, Vicki. Marshall. One of my favorite. One of my favorite comments about faculty meetings is that the quip that, you know, I know everything has been said that needs to be said, but not everybody has had a chance to say it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I've been, been jousting through the press with Bob for a, a year and a half or so about Sarah, so it's nice to be on a panel with Bob and find many things saying many things that I, I do agree with. I, I want to personalize this to a different, slightly different way. I was a faculty member for 18 years, colleges and universities. I was a conductor. I taught music. I taught singing. I was a singer. And actually, what we did in the performing arts is very much what you outline here. Uh, we commonly had all had had events where eight different choirs would appear from eight different universities. They would be conducted by eight different conductors. People could get a sense of which ones were very good, which ones were adequate, and which ones maybe should have rehearsed more. You know, And those same things happen with violin players, with bassoonists, with singers, and so forth. And I did that for 20, almost 20 years. And it is really hard. It is really hard because you can assemble a group of people who are eminently on paper qualified to render a decision. And they will be all over the place about that, about that decision. Uh, so I, I'm not sure this is the holy grail we're seeking through this. I, I personally agree that we need to find a better way 
to identify what students are learning because we're trying to educate far more of them than we were in the past. And the social necessity of doing that is greater for more people than it was in the past. And the tax money behind it is greater than at any time in the past. Uh, I think accreditation is under uh, siege right now, and that's, that's unfortunate. Uh, my first experience uh, with accreditation, uh, I, was, I was so young and so naive that I thought it was an honor to be appointed to the team that would help the institution get ready for the accreditation visit. Uh, so you can tell how long ago that was. Uh, and that was very hard work. Uh, and, and not just the quantitative hard work, but the discussion within a department. What are we really about? What do we really think students should learn here? And accreditation prompts that discussion. Uh, I think that's, that's an appropriate venue for it rather than having it defined through rule for the U.S. Department of Education, which, as my colleagues have indicated, would have an awfully hard time encompassing the breadth and, and recognizing those unintended consequences that several of us referred to. Thank you, Marshall. We have time for probably three questions from the audience, if there are three questions. We know we stand between you and lunch.